Go ahead, Michelin. Welcome to the fourth edition of the International Actuarial Day. I am Micheline Dion, 2023 President of the International Actuarial Association. Today, we have the privilege of spending the next hour or so with three actuaries that have dared exploring the capabilities of our actual training to address wider fields. First, let me say a few words on the International Actuarial Day. On September 2nd, 1895, the very first International Congress of Actuaries was held in Brussels. As such, the date of September 2nd remains the most significant and identifiable moment in history where actuaries from various countries came together for the very first time and laid the ground for the profession that we know today. In 2020, IA President Tonya Manning formalized the date of September 2nd as the International Actuarial Day. Since then, we are taking the opportunity to celebrate this anniversary with a webinar. We haven't changed the date. We decided it may be more appropriate to celebrate on Friday, September 1st, than on a Saturday. Last year, my predecessor, Rosanne Harris, focused her team on the big risk conversations such as climate issues, financial protection, and how actuaries act as guardian of the public trust. This year, I wanted to focus on how actuaries can extend their wings. Today, Kudzai, Roosevelt, and Sissi will encourage you to be bold about the opportunities open to actuaries. We hope to inspire actuaries to look beyond traditional actuarial practice and demonstrate how your actual skill sets opens a world of possibilities. Our first speaker will be Kudzai Chigiji, a fellow of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and of the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Kudzai was the chair of the Actuarial Society uh, of South Africa's Banking Committee from 2018 to 21, and was the secretary of the IAA Banking Working Group prior to that. She has also been a member of the IFOA Finance and Investment Board and is currently a member of the IFOA Council. She serves as an independent non-executive director to Let's See Go Bank Namibia, a digital bank. She now works in technology investments with a particular focus on finance services and healthcare within sub-Saharan Africa. She works with Venture Studios, where she looks at identifying opportunities and building startups, in addition to raising a tech-focused microphone. A very busy lady. Second, we'll hear from Roosevelt Moosley. Roosevelt is a principal in consulting actuaries with pineapple, pineapple sorry, actuarial resources and is the current president of the Casualty Actuarial Society. He assists companies in applying predictive analytics and machine learning to personal and commercial lines to assist in rate making, underwriting, and product development. He also applies predictive analytics to developing claim applications, including pre predicting large loss development, estimating claim settlement values, and detecting fraudulent claims. Roosevelt has 30 years of experience as a general insurance actuary. Lastly, we'll hear from CC Zhang. CC is a product actuary at Vitality who focuses on the development and implementation of innovative products for customers. She's interested in the social and environmental benefits that actuaries can bring. Social data includes information on consumer behaviors, well being, and engagement. As actuaries, how can we use this data to benefit the customers? And how can we use this data? to shape a better future. I'm also proud to mention that CC was a finalist in our Young Actuaries World Cup competition that we had last May in Sydney. Congratulations, CC. Now, a few words on the organization of our program today. Each speaker will make their presentation. It will be followed by a lively roundtable discussion amongst all speakers to gather their views on the future of the profession and their areas of interest. 
We'll invite questions from the audience. So please send these, these questions during their talk and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. To send in question, you go to the Q&A &A button uh, and that's the way we'll, we'll get your question. Now let's start the real presentation. Uh, and uh, Kudzai, we're looking forward for you hearing your very interesting actual perspective on banking. Thank you very much, Michelin. I hope you can all hear me very clearly. So as you've heard from her, I spent some years working in banking. I worked um, for an asset finance bank. I was part of a larger banking group. Um, and now I sit as an island um, in a banking, in a listed bank as well. And I guess over the last, over a decade, it's been interesting to see how the space has evolved, although the journey has lasted um, easily about three and a half to four decades. But let's get first into some foundational elements. Um, I, I just want to note at this point, some of you might have seen some of the slides that I'm going to use today. I created some of these slides for the launch that we had about two years ago when we're launching the banking subject. Some of the content has changed and my commentary obviously has changed because a lot has happened within banking is particularly the past year. Um, so yeah, hold tight. And uh, I hope this will be relevant to most of you, if not just interesting. So first, I think if we look at what actuaries do, there's things that we say that actuaries do. We, we make financial sense of the future. That's a popular one. We are risk experts. We influence financial services and the overall economy. And something that's coming more uh, to the fore nowadays that we serve in the public interest. Those are things we like to say. Now, let me bring it closer to home as far as banking is concerned. So first and foremost, um, on the next slide, we'll see that banking is a significant part of financial services. It would be remiss to say that we influence financial services if we don't work in banks. I mean, if you look at just from this graph, and this is sort of um, the growth of financial services over time. So since 1929 up to about 2010, we see that um, the credit intermediation and the security space has grown much faster and forms a, the majority of what financial services is deemed to be. Um, I reckon that in, the banking is about three times the size of insurance, um, at least three times. So if we want to honestly say that we influence financial services and economies, this is a space that we cannot ignore. Um, if you look at whenever there's a big economic crisis, when there's big shifts in the sort of global economy, macroeconomy, the first place to be hit is typically banking. And the individuals who are usually called to either clean up their act or come to the table of sort of big decision making are bankers, right? And the, it's not worth ignoring that. There's a reason for that. And so we can't ignore the significant part that that plays in overall financial services. And I guess if we go on to the next slide, if we look at how banking is central to the economy, there, there are a lot of things that we can think of. So think about your day-to-day -day activities. You make deposits, you make payments, you repay loans, um, you take out loans, um, and banks are very critical into managing that risk that's associated with borrowing short and lending long. So they do that for us. And then you look at their um, the how they manage uh, credit losses over time, right? Um, whether this is through a recession or through a boom, it's the, the role that banks play in sort of managing that overall cycle is quite critical. And finally, um, we look at some of, I guess, the not so great activities of, um, of some banks over time. And I'm going to touch on this and sort of the role that actuaries can play um, in mending this over time. Um, and in all of this, I think it's quite clear I hope at this point that we do have a role to play, not just in overall financial services, but also in impacting our day-to-day -day micro lives um, and those of the people around us. And we'll see some of that also come through in some of the later presentations, how we use the data that we, that we have access to and how that can have a social impact. We'll see that through Roosevelt and Sissy's presentations later as well. And then if we look at sort of how the actual profession has grown and progressed over the years. So we're very familiar with home insurance and car insurance. You see that in PNC, otherwise called um, uh, general insurance in some spaces. Life is a very established space. Healthcare is a younger space, but has been around for a couple of decades. Um, the investment space has grown um, very rapidly and was probably considered the first non-traditional space to come about. And obviously there's our bread and butter, which is pensions. Um, and what's interesting is 
we've managed to penetrate all these other spaces. And like I said, some of these other spaces are much younger. So for example, health insurance is young. The investment spaces is a young space as well. And so banking is really sort of the last sibling. Or, um, well, so far, at least we hope there'll be other siblings, but the last sibling in, in the group. And if you look at some countries, actuaries have been working within the banking space for quite some time. So in South Africa, we have about 15%. I'm pretty sure it's much higher than that now um, because we have seen a great recruitment drive for actuaries within banks. And in Australia, it's north of 10% of actuaries who identify themselves as working in banks. And these numbers have obviously been growing over a couple of decades, um, but we are starting to see that these are definitely areas that individuals are moving into, well, banking is specifically an area. And at this point, I think it's worth me pointing out that we have more students writing the banking fellowship exam in South Africa than writing the pensions exam, and almost around the same and sometimes more than the health insurance exam. So it's not necessarily day zero or day one. Um, we've made some decent progress to, to get to some of these numbers. And you know, some of you might be wondering, how did we get here? Um, is this something of the last decade or so? And the honest truth is that we started to see actuaries move in the droves into banking in the 80s. So before some of you were even born, definitely before I was born, uh, in the early 80s, we started to see actuaries move into banking. And we've got some very wonderful senior actuaries who built incredible careers in the space um, up to C-suite level. And not just as CRO, some that even as chief strategy offices and you know, building some of the biggest partnerships um, across industries, working with banks. And it seems like we, we, we slowed down for a while, but we've definitely started to pick up pace um, in the new millennia. So at, from the 2000 onwards, and it was around 2010 that ASA then decided to create the first banking fellowship subject. That was a banking fellowship applications or advanced subject. And about six, seven years later, we decided to introduce the banking fellowship uh, principal subject and then revamp the advanced application subject um, to be fit for purpose and for the time that we were in. And we've really sort of just been picking up pace since then. And some of you will be familiar. Um, those subjects are available internationally. Um, ASA and the IFOA have a partnership to offer that subject to, to members that are covered by those two member associations. And there are ongoing discussions with a wide range of other member associations. Um, to deliver the subject to them as well. And yeah, if you always want in more information, you can always reach out to the, um, the asset team to, to get more information. And okay, so going back to the role that banks play, if you think about it, and a, a, a question I get often is, oh, but you know, I, I'm in Kenya, or I'm in South Africa, or I'm in the USA, or I'm in the Far East, like, how, how can I use the subject? How can I use this information? Is it appropriate to have one subject, all of us? And one thing I can definitely tell you is that banking is global. So you will be familiar with, or you might not be familiar, uh, let me not assume it, the term globally systemically important banks. These are banks that, well, when they shift, the whole economy shifts. And we saw a lot of this uh, recently, even with um, Credit Suisse and UBS merging, and you have seen probably in the last day or two that they've had the highest profit per quarter that a bank has ever made. Um, and so it's, again, it's it would be remiss to act as if these are not significant events. But the, my point here is really that banking regulation for the most part is global and will typically follow a certain pattern, even if there's a lag in how it's implemented across the globe. So it is not inappropriate to study one qualification and be able to transfer it to other parts of the world or another type of bank or a bank in another geography. Um, and as much as I've listed you know, a lot of the big banks here, it's still important to understand that no matter which bank you're interfacing with, it exists within the system of banks, within the collective of banks, and they will follow a lot of the same rules. It's You'll have experienced this even with insurance. If you work with one insurer, you will typically be able to go work with another insurer. And yes, there's a bit of a learning curve, but a lot of the principles still apply. A lot of the regulation still applies. Um, don't want to labor the point, but in any case, also, Banking is very diversified. So one of the things that, one of the questions that I come across with a lot of people is they assume that when we talk about in, uh, banking, we're talking about investment banking. Investment banking is actually, in terms of staff and available data, is actually a very small portion of what we mean when we say in banking. When we talk about banks, we talk about central banks, uh, transactional banks, which is, you know, 
under your commercial banks, those would be the retail and corporate and asset finance banks sits there. You're talking about community banks, which are more familiar in some parts of the world than others. We're talking about the new neo banks. So a lot of these digital banks that we're seeing come up and even non-banks that perform a lot of the similar functions that a bank does. So a PayPal, it might not have a full banking license, but a lot of people transact there and they have a lot of the same staff that a typical normal bank would have. So when we say banks, bear that in mind, there's a vast range. And I didn't even list some of them here. So development bank would also be considered as part of the banking world. That being said, um, it's also worth comparing um, what we see in the banking world versus insurers, right? So a lot of the functions that you might be familiar with from an insurance perspective, you can also find them, well, you'll find a, I'll call it a parallel world <laughs> within a bank. So if you know how to do underwriting, you might do very well in a credit assessment team. If you know about provisioning and reserving, you will find a role that's that's relevant. If you're good at making sense of regulation and implementing it, there's an equivalent of that. Yeah, um, we spent a lot of time, I think, obsessing over ORSA within insurance some years ago. ICAP is the equivalent of that. Capital management, liquidity management, risk measurement, they're all like direct equivalents of those roles within banks. So if you do any of these things in an insurer, there's an almost an equivalent parallel job for you within a bank. Now, a lot of people will typically ask, okay, so what are the roles that I'll be able to fulfill within a bank? And the list is long. The list that I provide here, it's not even exhaustive. There's a long list. So a lot of people will probably think that, okay, I'm going to go into a risk role or maybe balance sheet management um, or, or liquidity management, uh, but typically they, they constrain themselves to that. And actually there's a much wider range of roles um, where quantitative skills are needed in a bank actually compared to an insurer. And so, I mean, I typically use my own career as an example. I actually moved into a digital research and development team where I was in charge of putting together all the business cases and pitching for funding and building all the analytics around those products as well as building and managing a loyalty program. And you might, that might initially not sound like typical banking type role, actuarial work, I'll call it that. But I used a lot of the pricing skills I learned, a lot of the reserving skills that I've learned in insurance. They were easily transferable. And I also learned some additional business skills, which I think would not have been as easy to develop within an insurance environment. But definitely the teams that I work with always found value um, in my actuarial perspective to the projects that we worked on. Um, that being said, I think fundamentally the mindset that you need to have if you are considering a role in banking um, is how do you transfer your skills? So like I've said, there are things that you will know from your day-to-day -day insurance work or investment space, whatever it is that you're doing that you can apply in that space. One of the things that I tell a lot of people who, who reach out who are looking to move into banking is don't pitch your, your qualifications necessarily, pitch how you can slot into a role because banks are very, they're, they're very functional focused. They're not very focused on titles and qualifications and you'll find different qualifications to different teams. But if you can speak directly to a function, you will typically do well in, in terms of finding um, a role. And so in terms of direct um, skills transfer, and I don't wanna spend too much time on this. So like I said, you know, if you're pricing for risk, you will now be pricing for credit risk losses. Um, if you were doing enterprise-wide risk management, you're really doing the same exact thing if you move into a bank. The context has just changed a bit. Um, and the same with asset liability management. If your focus was on the liquidity for claims, now your focus will be on the liquidity for withdrawal. So, you know, when people take money out of the bank to pay for whatever, that's the equivalent. Um, so there's no reason to think that it's a completely different beast and that you won't be able to make those transitions. Now, just to go into like a few of the big areas where we see a lot of actuaries moving into. So like, for example, I told you guys, I worked in a digital research and development team and also a loyalty programs, rewards team. Uh, so that's a lot of your product development. A lot of your pricing skills are very relevant to that. I have quite a few friends who moved into the climate change stress testing space. And I believe that's probably one of the biggest areas of growth within the banking space for quantitative skills. And there's a high demand for that. Um, like I said, like now I sit on uh, the board of a digital bank, uh, it's a fintech for all intended purposes. And again, you'll find a lot of the same skill sets are needed there. Everything from product development all the way to balance sheet management, liquidity management, treasury management, it's all necessary there. And community banks, although they might have more of a micro focus, they deal with a lot of the same risks. 
um, is just more focused on a specific space. So if you're thinking of where to go and what job titles to look for, what type of banks to look for, those, I guess those give you um, some of the, um, some hints there. And some people will then be like, okay, maybe if I go into risk management, that might be a, like a soft landing for me into the banking space so I can survey what's happening and be able to add value very quickly. And again, you need to think about, well, what are the range of risks there are? Because there are very different teams that manage all of these things. So as you'll see on the next slide, um, it's everything like, so credit risk is, it, it's more prominent in banks, obviously, than it is insurers, but they're always looking for strong quant skills. Um, and actuaries typically will fit the bill for that. But then market risk also features a lot more. Operational risk looks different, um, but is quite prominent as well within banks, and more so is liquidity and capital risk. Um, liquidity probably more so than capital risk in comparison to insurance. So even if you want to go into the risk space within banking, I would then um, urge you to, to think about the different types of risk. Um, so that you can slot yourself into the appropriate space. Now, just as I'm wrapping up, um, hopefully, um, so we developed a syllabus that focuses on these different areas and it's really tailored around the different risk elements. And then you're able to apply that into sort of more of the functional roles, even beyond risk. So we try to be as comprehensive, particularly with a focus on commercial banks. So we weren't really trying to compete with like an investment banking qualification necessarily or development banking qualification because we wanted also to provide something where there's the highest number of jobs, number one, um, and two, where there's also a lot of data that we can play around with, right? So like I said earlier, um, that was that was for particular focus. And much like any other subjects, all of the different elements are covered. So, you know, there's educational material, there's live online tutorials, which is actually not common for fellowship subjects, but um, that's been part of the offering from um, the banking fellowship from day one. Uh, there's an international offering. So even if you're not an ASO or IFOE member, there is an offering for you. And finally, like it, they are online exams. So the idea was to be as um, accessible to everyone um, from early days. And um, in terms of CPD, because some people have been have, have said that they don't see enough CPD. And honestly, I'll say, I think there's almost too much CPD for people working in banking because you can use anything from any other banking um, organization. So there are a lot of um, banking associations out there and those count for your CPD. Um, the IA has a very active banking forum. ASA has an active committee as well. And the IFOA now has a banking community. So if you are members of any of these institutions, I do encourage you to join them. Even if you aren't like in banking yet and are just curious, they discuss all the hot topics every day. And um, it's quite valuable to just be part of that community if this is something you're thinking about even beyond that. Um, and for those individuals who think that this is like a very foreign space, what I will say is, um, so one of the projects we embarked on around the time we were um, revamping the one subject and developing the other was to introduce banking examples into earlier subjects so that it did not seem completely foreign once you got to fellowship level. And, you know, just to make the mind adept to the idea of a career in banking. So you'll see as the years progress that there are more and more examples. Um, and we've given them to the exam teams that are in charge of these different subjects. Um, and they're being rolled out gradually. So that is definitely um, something that's on our radar because we, we understand the need to, so, you know, to make it familiar, to make the language familiar, because language is a big barrier when people are making that jump. But if you've never sort of seen some of these terms, um, it can be, can feel intimidating. And finally, my last slide. Um, for those of you who are wondering what's next, uh, like I said, ASA is working with other member associations in terms of education partnerships, there are more CPD events, and you'll see even on ActiveView, there are more, there's more banking content. Um, there is active engagement with employers, particularly central banks and um, risk management and human resource teams within the large banks. And yeah, we're also chatting to regulators about what is in the pipeline and how best to position our skills to be able to move in that space, much like what we did with the first nine and you know, how we've succeeded in that space. I said a lot in a very short space of time, but the moral of the story is that this space is ripe for the taking. And for those of you who are looking for something slightly different, consider a career in banking. Thank you very much, Kazai. Your uh, uh, enthusiasm for banking is uh, very, uh, we can sense it, and it's uh, very uh, motivating. So thank you so much for your presentation.
Now we're going to move to another topic, artificial intelligence. Uh, so Roosevelt, please, um, it's yours. Thank you, Micheline, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and spend a few minutes to talk to you about the opportunities for actuaries in the space of artificial intelligence. Um, I, I want to uh, first go through um, level setting and talk about uh, how we define AI. Um, there are a lot of, of, of definitions out there. There are a lot of people that have different concepts of what AI is. And so I want to level set uh, in terms of some of the, the thinking on, on AI and, and what it really means. Um, I then want to pivot to talk about examples of actuarial applications of AI. Um, and as we talk about the definitions and the examples, um, one of the things I hope you begin to see is that um, foundationally, a lot of what is going on in artificial intelligence um, uh, has been growing over time, and a lot of the skills that that actuaries have have, and I think can uh, really uh, feed into it, power um, a lot of of what's happening in the space of AI. Um, and then this will lead it directly into a discussion of what opportunities uh, can we as actuaries um, think about in in the space of artificial intelligence. So first, uh, the definition. Um, if if you ask anyone out there what they believe artificial intelligence is, you will get a wide variety of, of answers. And, and even if you look at uh, definitions that are out there by, by some of the, um, uh, the groups that uh, in theory are leading the charge for AI, um, even those, those definitions may be a bit, a bit varied. Um, so I, I pulled a few examples of definitions here and I've highlighted a few things that I think are important to understand from a, um, from a, a, a baseline perspective in terms of what uh, we we mean or, or what, um, at least what I mean when, when we talk about the, the field of artificial intelligence. Um, first, the, the, there's the idea that, that machines or, or computers uh, can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. And we'll see some examples of that here um, in a second. Um, but a, a key part of the definition uh, is is highlighted in the the second definition, which is essentially a, a combination of data and computer science um, to enable problems to be solved. Uh, and I, I think that is the key uh, to the the thinking around AI and and what it means going forward for actuaries. Um, it the AI also uh, involves the ability to take information from a lot of different sources um, and, and to be able to synthesize and, and infer um, uh, both information and solutions uh, from that those inputs. Um, and as inputs change over time, being able to adjust to those new inputs to, uh, again, continue to perform uh, these human-like tasks. And so when you when you start to put all of that together, uh, really what, what you can think of AI, if you go to the next slide, in a, uh, in a way that, that sort of looks like uh, this sort of process where um, you've got some outcome that you're driving toward. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe what this outcome here is in, in a second, uh, but you've got some outcome that's being driven toward and this outcome is powered by um, first, a, a lot of information, a lot of data that could potentially come from a lot of different places. Um, some analysis of that data um, that can happen in very sophisticated ways, like um, uh, some of the, the more sophisticated machine learning that's happening today, um, done in an environment of, of uh, computing power that we today we've never seen before and continues to increase at, at a significant pace that, that ultimately leads to, to an outcome. And um, a, a different context, but 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 hopefully I'll, I'll be able to to sort of demonstrate um, uh, some of the, the questions around AI and and some of the fears potentially around AI with, with this example. Um, I was actually at a a, uh, a dinner um, this past weekend, and um, I, I was sitting next to actually an, an insurance agent, insurance broker um, here in the U.S. 
And uh, the question he asked me once he found out I was an actuary was, do, did I think um, artificial intelligence was going to replace the actuary? Um, and, and we had that conversation and I, I, I gave him a number of reasons why I thought the, the, the uh, AI wasn't going to replace the actuary. Uh, that, that actuaries, I think, could, could actually be very fundamental in continuing to progress the, the space of AI. Um, he, he then said to me that he thinks at some point AI is going to replace the agent. Um, and, and I was curious as to, to why he said that. Um, but as I was thinking through this, I remembered back to um, this 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 sort of AI powered application on the right here. Um, if for the, some of you may be familiar with this, the 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 picture on the right is actually the picture of a, a robot bar on one of the big cruise ships. And and the the robot bar, there's two robotic arms there, um, and and a, 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 a whole host of, of of alcohols that are, are hanging from the ceiling at the top, and and it, it was kind of interesting because you go up, you you uh, put in your order, um, the the robot arms would grab all of the things that they needed to to create whatever it is that you ordered, um, and and they would provide it to you. And, and if you think about it from, from the perspective of the conversation I had, um, when this robot bar was developed, um, someone could have asked the question, well, will a robot bar re replace bartenders? And, and ultimately, I think, as you can see, the answer has been no. And the reason is um, everything that a, a bartender does is cannot, well, is, hasn't been and maybe can be effectively replaced by um, a, a machine or a robot. And, and in a similar fashion, um, you can think about that, the, the, the skill set of an actuary. Um, I, I believe AI, I believe um, machine learning, um, a lot of the advances in technology can help empower what we do and help us do what we do better. Um, but uh, there are lots of, of skills, there are lots of, of value that the actuaries bring. Um, and I don't think ultimately the outcome is in, uh, a machine can replace that kind of value at least anytime soon. Um, and I'll, I'll try to, to, to demonstrate some of this as we go through a couple of examples. Um, the, the, there, there are a number of, of examples of AI, and generally when you talk about AI, especially today, the first thing you go to is the idea of chat GPT. Um, but I, I, I want to back up and really kind of put it in context in terms of where we are on the, the, the continuum or, or where AI could go. So if you think about... Um, the, the capability of, of AI right now. There's there's the idea of narrow intelligence, which is simply um, uh, AI, AI that, that can uh, respond to a very limited uh, task. Uh, you, the robot bar, you, you, you design the robot bar to um, create a series of, of drinks, but it, it, it's not going to learn from, you know, special requests that have made it made in the past. It's per pre-programmed to do a, a specific set of things. Um, the idea of general intelligence expands that to um, allow machines to, to think and, and um, be able to perform uh, the same kinds of tasks that human can, humans can. And, and that's that that's where we are kind of in the in the spectrum of, of AI. Um, the idea of super intelligence is the the field and, and we're we're not there yet. Um, perhaps one day we 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 will be there, but super intelligence is the idea that that the um, the the machines can now surpass the intelligence of humans and can um, essentially function on a, a much um, uh, a much higher uh, level than than humans can. Also, similarly from functionality, um, when we think about um, uh, reactive AI, um, it, it's simply designed to react to a specific task. I go up, I order a drink, the, the AI reacts and creates that drink. Um, the, 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 where we are today in the functionality is really the limited memory. It's the ability of, of AI to store data, learn from those past experiences, um, to continue to improve. Um, and, and that's where we are in terms of things like chat GPT or um, self-driving cars, as an example. Um, the theory of a, theory of mind as self-aware AI is, is again, um, there, there are concepts that, that folks are working on, uh, but the idea that, that the um, 
AI can now be self-aware of itself and and actually uh, function as a human would in terms of changing their mind and learning new things and 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 really uh, again surpassing where where the humans are. So if you think about where we are in the the space of AI, uh, we we really are. Um, it, at least as as it's been defined and laid out really really in very early stages um and in in a space where i think actuaries can can influence pretty significantly where this is going um, so just a couple of, of ideas of examples of ai um so so when you again we think about what this means for actuaries um uh there there's several things that i think are important for us to to uh, remember um first uh going back to the the slide that i was on that, that sort of talked about the process the idea is that we there's a significant amount of data that's available to for us that can be used in in much more sophisticated ways um, and and deployed uh, in 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 ways that that take advantage of technology, uh, and so I think as actuaries, it's going to require us to continue to build our skill set in terms of familiarity with um, lots of data coming from many disparate sources, um, and how to continue to identify additional data sources that we can apply to to, to the the processes that that we are involved in. Um, Additionally. Consequently, um, with all of this new data and the ability to analyze it in a much more sophisticated way, uh, again, it's going to require us to continue to build our skill set uh, in terms of, of more advanced uh, analytics and machine learning techniques um, and, and how to uh, uh, incorporate within that process um, the actual judgment that that we are 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 known for, um, as well as the the incorporation of ethical concerns and ethical considerations, um, and ultimately the the deployment. How do we? Um, uh, how are we uh, continually involved in not just ensuring that that a, an initial deployment uh, goes well, um, and and ultimately uh, that deployment takes the. Uh, the the best use of technology that's out there, um, but but that continuous learning loop uh, is 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 realized where as new data and as new information comes in, um, as the environment within which the the analytics happens changes, how do we continue to incorporate that uh, into the learning uh, and continue to improve on uh, the systems that are developed. So uh, a couple, just a, a couple of examples of how this can happen and and how how it is happening. Um, here here's one example, um, and, and this example actually um, uh, borrow borrows, but but is is akin to you can sort of think of kind of the the navigation system type data um, that's available. It, again, it's example, it's sort of an example of an AI type application um, you know, when the if you need to get somewhere and, and you, you put it into your navigation system, uh, there are, are, are a whole series of, of calculations or a whole series of, of models that essentially um, define for you the best route, co route considering traffic, considering efficiencies, con considering everything that's going on. Um, and so there's a, a, a lot of of input data that's then processed in real time uh, to give you some real time output. And so um, if you think about that from an insurance perspective, um, the that navigation, that trip that you go on, uh, not only has a, a time element to it, I want to get there the quickest and safest this way, um, but also has a risk element to it. Um, uh, so how can I get there in maybe the least risky way uh, that that could potentially be applied for for an insurance application? And, and so um, the same kind of information that's used for, for understanding how best to get there from a navigation perspective uh, can also be be incorporated when you um, look at the the potential risk. And so I'm looking at the uh, the the road structure. I'm looking at the the speeds that are being driven on the roads, um, the traffic density of the roads, and and potential and using that um, to dynamically assess the risk that I'm taking on, um, but also in, in potential in real time. Um, dynamically mitigate the risk uh, and and provide potential options to to the user that says if you do this um, this 
potentially reduces your risk and could potentially reduce your your um, your insurance costs as well. Um, so again, one example of how um, these types of things can and are being applied uh, in in uh, insurance context from an actuarial perspective. Um, the the second. Uh, the second example here is is a uh, it, it's a claim fraud detection model, and so it's a a model that's used. Um, it, it's not necessarily a a new model per se, but in in this particular case, the application um, that was being developed uh, was an application that that essentially would allow for straight through um, claim processing uh, by a, a an individual claimant um, who could essentially handle. Um, uh, much of their contents claim. Uh, and so the it was sort of the reverse of a, a claim fraud model um, for a claim that was uh, th that was deemed to be less suspicious. Um, the, the customer could then go through a, a basically a series of, of self-service claim options and handle a lot of it on their own. Um, and, and so uh, the, the ultimately the, the the application that was being developed was was really for uh, the the customer to um, be able to 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 essentially act like their own claim adjuster, uh, but it required a, a series of, of of significant analytics up front again to be be able to take in a lot of of disparate information, a lot of information that um, could uh, that was potentially coming from a number of different places and potentially changing very fast. Uh, to be able to make a pretty quick decision on uh, whether this was a claim that was eligible for uh, the self-service option versus needing to go a more traditional route. Uh, so again, uh, it, these are examples of, of AI-type AI applications that are, are occurring now, but I think also build the, the foundation of the framework for how uh, this can be continued in the, the future. Um, so, so I, I want to talk just a, a little bit um, about some of the the opportunities and where uh, actuaries, I think, can um, add additional uh, value in the space of of AI. One of the um, significant uh, areas of discussion in in many jurisdictions, including the the U.S. right now, is the idea of fairness, and and it's the the idea of fairness not so much from an actuarial perspective. Um, not not just from an actuarial perspective, where um, if we can support something from the data, uh, then uh, then it is acceptable. Um, but but really from the perspective of the impact of models, the impact of of AI on um, uh, protected or or potentially marginalized communities, and, and so there are a number of of discussions that are happening in the the context of of model models um, in the context of our artificial intelligence on how to define and how really to to measure and potentially even mitigate um, some of the 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 social inequities uh, that models may capture through their through the data and how um, uh, the the analysis of this this data may potentially perpetuate some of these inequities and so um, I believe uh, this is a an area where um, given our professionalism uh, could, uh, requirements uh, uh, this is an area where I think actuaries uh, and our analytics uh, skills an area where actuaries I think can contribute pretty significantly to this discussion. Um, and and to uh, the the process of, of finding solutions to deal with some of these challenges. Um, opportunities also abound in the area of of, of transparency, and and one of the the challenges um, as you talk about AI, especially with the the general uh, kind of the general community, uh, is, is that it it. it feels like a black box because in a lot of cases it, it may be. Um, all, all people see is this computer doing something behind the scenes that's very sophisticated um, and then producing a decision that could potentially have a significant impact on, on their life. And so the idea of, of transparency is, is how do we open up what's happening here in a way that that allows those that are impacted by AI are impacted by by models and development um, to better understand what's going on. 
Um, it, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, but but there are things that you can think about along the way um, in, in terms of what's being incorporated or input into um, a lot of these, these systems, how the, the, the data is being used and being processed, um, and ultimately um, what that means for, for the end user. Um, and it is an area where, uh, again, speaking from a U.S. perspective, it's an area where where, where government is getting involved significantly to to really try and drive um, uh, to to drive the change in regulation on how to to continue to make things like AI and and these models more uh, more transparent. Um, the the last opportunity I'll, I'll just point to here quickly. Um, is the idea of risk mitigation, and and I alluded to this a bit when I talked about the um, uh, the example of of rogue characteristic data. Um, but the the idea here is that that uh, you know actuaries historically and traditionally have been been really good at at measuring risk, um, and then you know, using those measurements of risk to to come up with solutions for for how to 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 uh, manage that risk. Um, but I also think we, we uh, our skill set can have a, a significant role to play in, in risk mitigation. How do we take this information, um, uh, understand the risk better, and, and then be a part of the conversation that helps uh, society mitigate the risk? And I, I think that's a, a significant opportunity here, again, that, that we as actuaries have the uh, the, the skill set and I believe the, the influence to be able to, to help with and so um, uh, ultimately, I think where where all of this goes is again, um, uh, if you think about the the series of of things that have happened over my career, and I've been doing this for thirty years, um, as technology as data continues to advance, um, the question of whether the actuary was going to continue to be relevant has has always been there. Um, and, and I, I contend that not only have we continued to be relevant, that but we've continued to demonstrate our value even as these things happen. And I believe uh, the same will be true with with AI. Uh, so that I will will turn it over back to you, Micheline. Yes. No. Thank you very much. It, it's very interesting. Uh, we're receiving very good comments. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for demystifying the, the topic and, and also uh, illustrating uh, to us like, the benefits. So much appreciated. It's uh, also a good link to the our next presenter, CC Zhang, about the social data. Uh, CC. Cool, thank you. Um, hi everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about social data. And so in the context specifically for today, I've defined it as data about improvements to society and improvements to people's lives. Now, I'm, I wanna talk about how we can measure and quantify social benefits when it comes to innovative products in banking and in insurance. And the reason why I want to talk about this and talk about the quantification is because I think that's going to help us drive further innovation and further product change in the future towards and geared towards products that are good for society and for the environment. Cool. So before I go into those details, I just wanted to explore and share with you a few different various ideas of, uh, of product innovation that already exists right now um, across all, all the insurance industries uh, and, and across banking, because there's a lot of interesting things that we're doing. Um, and I just want to share some examples first. So in life and health insurance, we already have um, what I would call gamification of well-being. So this is when we encourage people to be active, to exercise, do their step, steps, go cycling, um, and rewarding them by, uh, I guess, a gamification, which is to make it fun, to give people points, and to reward them. Sometimes we've got a, you know, a metaverse with an avatar that can look like you, you can compete with your friends, um, and just making it fun to promote um, greater exercise, greater physical activity. And then what we have on, on the other side is we have rewards for this behavior. So when you get points, you can then use your points to get rewards. So it could be discounts, it can be prizes, like, you know, ASOS, Amazon, for example. Um, and what that does is that it helps to incentivize people by making it fun, 
incentivize people to exercise, but also incentivize them by giving them rewards. And sometimes the rewards can actually be in the form of, say, a donation to a charity. And that in itself helps to promote ESG um, as well. Um, so some other examples in car insurance, we've got telematics insurance, which is which is not new. It is very popular um, and it's, you know, it's using a black box that you install in your car and it helps to track the quality of your driving. So how you drive, where you drive, what time you drive. And what it's trying to do is trying to change behavior and improve people's driving habits. Um, so, I mean, Roosevelt talked earlier about the use of AI in trying to lead to better um, traffic and, and, and driving. So there's definitely a link there and a lot we can do to um, change behavior and lead to better driving. Um, and so what happens is that if you can incentivize people through, for example, premium discounts, then that's gonna give a real monetary, real tangible benefit to customers and that will help drive and incentivize better behavior. And not only is that good for, for customers, but I mean, it, it is good for society in the sense that it'll lead to you know, less accidents, less deaths and hospitalization. Some other examples um, in the area of banking, um, we've got apps where um, customers can go in and categorize their spending. And that really helps them to have an overall view of their spending habits and help them create budgets. Um, it, and it can help them um, create spending goals and help to meet those goals. And so these things are really helpful for customers, especially if they want to increase their savings um, and get better with budgeting and just general financial literacy. Uh, we've also got uh, Roundup um, apps, which are quite popular as well these days. Um, you make a transaction with your with your card, and it'll your your bank will automatically round it up to say the nearest pound or dollar, and that extra bit will automatically go into a savings account. Um, and some companies have an additional boost uh, for customers where the interest rate that they get on this savings account is boosted. So again, this is a um, really nice product initiative that helps to encourage saving, um, to encourage banking, and just overall um, more financial awareness. Some other examples, um, again, back to life and health insurance. Um, you, can, you can get, um, again, um, this is a more of a premium monetary incentive, upfront premium discount on your life insurance. And this discount, it can be say up to 40%. And the upfront discount that you get, you can actually maintain that throughout your policy if you are active and if you exercise. Um, and then the other side of it is that if, you're, if you don't um, engage in activity and exercise, your premiums can increase. So there's a bit of loss aversion here where people are kind of incentivized to stay active so that they can maintain that lower discounted premium. We also have things like cashback, so on, on healthy food. So this is where you can get a discount on your grocery shopping. Um, and the discount that you get on your grocery shopping actually depends on how much you exercise and how active you are during, during that period. Um, and so it encourages, again, um, activity, which improves more mortality, morbidity um, as a social impact. But on the other side, you've got this added element of nutrition where you get a discount when you go grocery shopping, but that discount only applies to healthy products. Um, so again, that, that creates a behavioral change and incentivization to buy healthy products because that's where you're going to get more of a discount. Um, some other examples, um, back to banking. Um, we've got innovation in, in banking in the form of dynamic interest rates. So um, you, you have a, a monthly interest rate on your savings that actually changes each month depending on your activity levels. Um, and so in this example, if you are very active and you achieve the highest activity levels and diamond, you get 7.25% interest rate, which is a, a boost compared to um, if the interest rate that you get if you don't engage. So, um, so I mean, that, that's, that's really interesting and that gives an incentive for customers to be active in order to get a, a high interest rate because there's a reward there. 
Um, it's also interesting that we don't always, I think activity and exercise is probably the easiest measurement, but there's also other elements of health that we can reward people for. So for example, if people go and get um, you know, a dental check, flu vaccination, colonoscopy, pap smear, then we can actually give them points for that and reward them uh, for doing those health checks. So what this does and what the social impact is, is that it encourages healthy living and exercise. It encourages people to go and do health checks and screenings, and that in turn will help to detect serious illnesses early and improve mortality and morbidity outcomes. Cool. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So, I mean, these are uh, a lot of different examples of great innovation in insurance and in banking. And I mean, you do hear about it, um, I would say more often in media releases. So these are just a few examples of talking about these benefits to society um, that are found in some media releases. So you can see, you know, the talk about in car insurance, you can get 60% off your premium due to telematics. Um, they've reduced the number of speeders by 60 to 70%. Um, on the health and life insurance side, we've got improvements in hospitalization rates, healthcare costs. We can get 75% you know, improvement in mortality due to all of these great innovative ideas and, and new products. Um, and I think it's great that um, people do talk about this, but I have felt that it's more, it's not talked about en enough. Um, it's often just in media releases. So um, yes, next, next slide, thanks. Um, so what I wanna focus on is how can we drive further quantification of these social benefits and why actuaries should take the lead in doing so. Um, so, I mean, actuaries, when we do our quantifications, uh, you know, there, there's a typical um, analysis that we do. We'll look at expenses, capital, sales, etc. I think I think that we should have an extra layer of quantification that covers the social benefits of the products that we're selling in insurance and in banking. Um, there is a small element of that that is covered in sales. If you think that your new product has good social value, it's going to give customers value, it's going to drive sales, then yes, um, that could be covered in the sales, sales element and sales projections. However, I think for that number to be believable and those sales projections to be believable, you do have to go into that detail of actually showing the quantifications of those benefits. And so I think what we need to do as actuaries is to try and use social data try and quantify the social benefits of our products um, in order to drive further product change. So just some high level ideas of, of the quantification of the social benefits. Um, in, in telematics car insurance, I mean, insurers should have information about customers who use telematics, who don't use telematics. They can do a comparison of the rates of you know, death, accidents, minor injuries, and serious injuries to actually be able to quantify the benefits that they are giving to customers um, based on their products that have greater behavioral change and the positive impact of this behavioral change or of safer driving. Uh, of course, you need to be careful when, when you do the actual analysis that you know, correlation versus causation you might need some detailed causal models um, in order to then verify um, your modeling. On, and then you can also use public data from public health systems in order to quantify not just the impacts on your customers, but the impacts to society and the public sector in general. Um, because if we are helping to drive behavioral change, better driving, less accidents, less hospitalizations, and we're also reducing the burden on the public health system. And so if we can quantify that, then that's, again, a great message that we can bring. And uh, another example um, in the health and life insurance industries, again, just, you know, we can do very simple comparisons against um, customers. Um, sorry, back, back one slide. Yeah, uh, back one slide. Yeah, that's one. Thank you. Um, if, if we're able to break down our customer cohorts into those who have um, high physical activity who exercise and those who have low physical activity and don't exercise, or actually, you know, we, we can compare their mortality rates, morbidity and hospitalization and actually be able to show the impact that we've had um, on our customer outcomes due to us giving 
um, giving them the option of products that incentivize them to take care of their well-being. So that's quite a powerful message if we can show that actually, you know, our customers have an X percent lower mortality rate uh, compared to the rest of the industry or compared to um, the rest of um, dem demographics. Um, and then again, you know, we can bring in impacts on public health system as well, because that's a great positive message. Cool. Uh, next slide. I mean, in banking as well, if, if we're offering apps that try and increase savings, you know, can we compare the, the, the savings rates of customers who use the apps, who don't use their apps, customers who use the apps a lot versus uh, only occasionally? Uh, have we a actually able been able to drive behavioral change? Because if we can quantify that, then that would be great. Uh, if we can also, you know, survey our customers and ask about their financial confidence uh, for those who have used the app and haven't used the app, then again, we can show that the benefits that we have brought to our customers. And yeah, so I think I think what we need to do um, is I think the first step is to make sure that we have the right data in place. I think that's probably one of the hardest steps, um, setting up the data so that we have that data uh, that we can use to analyze. So, you know, of course, we need to make sure that um, the data we collect, customers have given consent to use it. We need to make sure that the data we collect has the right um, key metrics that helps us then to do our analysis and quantification of the social impacts. We also need to make sure that the data is, is set up in the right way. If it's, uh, it might need to be anonymized, but we also need um, identifiers in the data in order to match our different data sets in order to get the most insights that we can. So I think that first step of getting the data sorted out um, is, is, is really first and it might, might be quite tricky. But once you have that, then really you have so much information that you can utilize in order to quantify the social benefits of these innovative products. And so then the next step is we need to then communicate these social benefits um, and, and measurements and quantifications both internally and externally. So for example, um, the board and senior management might be trying to make a decision on which product to launch. There might be three ideas, but there's only enough resources to launch one. Um, if we're able to not only give them the, the traditional actuarial quantifications, but if we can also show them and quantify the social benefits, benefits to our customers and to society, then that might actually help the board make a decision on which product to go to um, and which product to launch. Also internally, we should, um, sorry, if we, if we go back to the previous slide. Um, also, if we um, internally measure, measure these um, social benefits and, um, and take it to the internal actuaries, then that might actually help them better calculate reserves and pricing. Because if we are able to, at a more granular custom, customer level, be able to measure and quantify their improvements in mortality, morbidity, hospitalization rates, um, likelihood of getting into a car accident and, and driving behavior, then actually that will allow other, other actuaries in reserving and pricing to make better, uh, more accurate calculations. Um, and then as well, customers and general public, uh, we should definitely communicate to them externally on all these benefits. Um, because customers, you know, if they're aware of all these innovative ideas and products that they have access to, then that's going to help them encourage and participate and drive better behavioral change. Um, and as well, if we, if we um, communicate this more to the general public, then it's going to create better awareness, marketing, and also better sales. Cool. Um, and yeah, just just final slide of um, highlighting and summarizing the impacts of, of what this will do by measuring um, and quantifying the social, social impacts is that one, it'll you know, give us a reason to collect um, better data, um, improve our data systems, um, and, and it will help to quantify the benefits that we bring to society and to the environment. And the impact of that is that it will help us build better business cases which will help to drive further innovative products and hopefully faster development of innovative products that are good for society. Um, it will allow us to help compare different products as well. So we'll be able to prioritize what products we think match um, the company's objectives, especially these days where the strategy 
of companies is often to have um, you know, a strong presence and action in ESG, in social and environmental aspects. So all of this will also help drive the vision and the strategy of companies as well. So that's all for me today. Then you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. I I thought I had pushed the button and I am sorry. So sometimes you push it twice. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Sissy. Uh, and I thought we would have a round table. And uh, I think it's uh, time has been so interesting a uh, 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 presentation that time has passed by. So I, I guess I was just going to ask a few questions to uh, from. Uh, some of them picked from uh, the question that we received, and, uh, and 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 because we, I understand that normally we should we should uh, finish by uh, eight well eight fifteen and fifteen in ten minutes from us anyway. Uh, so I guess I'll start with Kazai. Um, yeah, there's been a question out there that okay, so uh, bank uh, actually seems to be. Uh, very successful in banking in in, in Africa. Uh, there's some uh, in, in Australia. I've heard myself that in Mexico it's also very uh, uh, well accepted that actuaries. But there's a number of countries where uh, it seems to be very difficult to get into uh, banking because it's uh, <clears throat> other professionals and they don't really see the the use of actuaries. So the question to you is for these. Uh, places where uh, actuaries would be interested in joining in. How can one convince banking that effectively actuaries can be of use? Right. Well, thanks, Michelin. Um, that's a really good question. So firstly, I think, um, and I've responded to John Robertson's question, I think there's a cultural element here as well. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I think you'll find that in a lot of emerging um, economies, most professionals tend to be a lot more entrepreneurial, it's not just actuaries, and will typically go out of their way to either start their own businesses, consulting firms, move into new areas. And there are many reasons for this. It, it, there's a pure cultural element, but there's also the issue of, are there enough jobs in the insurance industry? If you look at the size of insurance industry in the UK or the USA versus most African countries, most Asian countries, most South American countries, it's very different. It's, you know, chalk and cheese, it's worlds apart. So if you are graduating with this qualification and you can't get jobs in insurance, or the insurance industry isn't just large enough, what are you supposed to do with this very expensive, very hard piece of paper um, that you got? So you start to look for opportunities elsewhere and like I said the entrepreneurial spirit might just be different but for those um and I and I'll tell you sort of what my journey and those who entered banking around my time and before me took versus perhaps I think one of the challenges that those who come from insurance have when you're pitching yourself to um to work in a bank like I said before they're not really stressed about what your title is and you know the letters before after your name and how many degrees you have it's do you have the specific skill set to to work in this particular function and i think as actuaries we've been sort of spoiled because you can just say oh i'm an actuary or i have an actuarial science degree and you'll get a job you can't do that in a bank or at least for most jobs you need to really position yourself i mean very few people i worked with in banking even knew that i was an actuary and that's true for a lot of people who um who were before my time. Um, and so I think we're going to have to do some work as a profession on how we position our skill set versus our titles and you know whatever acronyms come out of that so that we are more function and purpose driven. Um, so yeah, those are just some of my initial thoughts on that. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's interesting because it seems to be <laughs> effectively uh, uh, some of countries have, have tried very much to get into this, but somehow it seems uh, that it's very difficult to... Uh, to, to get through. Uh, AI, uh, Roosevelt. Um, so there's lots of things that can happen. Like where do you see the most promising uh, places for actuaries uh, in the, in AI? Oh, goodness. Um, and I think some of the most promising places uh, for actuaries really just um, go back to our skill set of being able to, to analyze and assess data. Uh, and information. Um, the uh, many of the AI solutions are powered by uh, the ability to to analyze data and produce actionable insight from that data. 
And so uh, if, if you think about the skill set of actuaries, I think our skill set is uniquely designed to, to be able to do that in a number of different contexts. And so those are probably some of the, the most promising places. Um, I, I, as I alluded to in the presentation, I think um, overlaying our professionalism requirements on top of that, um, it does speak to a, a pretty significant societal uh, discussion that's going on right now about how to use AI responsibly. So I, I do think that, that is also an area where where actuaries can can provide some unique uh, insight uh, because that's what we we live and breathe and and our professionalism standards. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sissy, um, uh, I don't know that there are many actuaries involved in what you do. Uh, how have you been involved in this in the, in the first place? And uh, where did you see this leading in terms of future steps? Yeah, so, I mean, quantifying social benefits is a big part of what I do in my role as an actuary. So I'm a product actuary in product research and development, which is quite a unique role that actuaries don't often get to do. Um, so I'm quite lucky I get to develop and uh, implement new and innovative products. And so I work at Vitality where we have a strong focus on getting our customers healthy um, and sharing the values back to them when they are healthy because there are mortality and morbidity benefits. So I do that day to day um, because I need to show why the products that I have designed, we have designed are good both for our company, but also for society. Um, and so luckily we do have uh, a lot of good data set up and good data systems that we can actually um, quantify this, the benefits to mortality and morbid morbidity um, of our customers because they are taking care of their health and well-being. And so I think a lot of companies are trying to um, are trying to be more socially responsible and have an ESG agenda. And so I think the, the movement is that companies are starting to develop a lot more customer centric products that are good for customers and good for society. So there definitely will be a need um, as this takes off um, of being able to quantify this um, so that these companies can, can keep developing and launching these good products. I just seen a question about, okay, so there's lots of interesting thing developing in insurance, but there's also uh, a proliferation of, of exclusions. Uh, we, we only want the best, the best risk, and and, and we, uh, and it's not necessarily socially good. Any uh, thoughts on that? I think actually, with the use of um, AI, machine learning, so uh, you know, touching on what, what Roosevelt has been talking about, that actually we can much better um, define and quantify the risks, and even if it's a bad risk, um, someone's unhealthy. If we can quantify it. Um, accurately, then insurers should be comfortable to take on that risk if they can price it correctly um, and they're comfortable to take it on. So I think with new technology um, and AI that we should be able to actually be more inclusive. Okay, well, oh, oh, we'll like, keep our finger crossed that effectively we go in that direction because right now it's, it's not exactly uh, very obvious to see. Uh, I'd like to, it's now uh, basically coming to uh, the, very, the very end. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all, like, uh, uh, not only the speakers, but you that joined us. Uh, you've been numerous, uh, and uh, I, it's, it's amazing over time. I was seeing more and more people joining. So that is a tribute to the uh, quality of the speakers that we had today. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, there are some that have been answered and, and some like there's a few left. So we'll see what you can do with that. Uh, and uh, basically, I want to uh, conclude with uh, some remarks that effectively the actual science is not a static one. It evolves as new risk surface and uh, or new technology are made available. And with improved knowledge, which allows us to better understand and explain the risk, but also the opportunities that are developing under our eyes. Let us not fear new challenges, but embrace them. So I'd like to thank you all. Thank you, Kudzai, Roosevelt, and Sisi for your much appreciated commitment to the actuarial profession and for being us today and for those wonderful presentations that you made. Thank you, thank you so much.